Hello everyone. Hello again. So today is the AI world and we we are using AI tools everywhere in our business to find any uh, any content but content any code anything we use AI in our day to day lives. And uh, do you ever care about legalities of AI? How can we use and all? Our next talk going to be around this. So uh, let's give a warm welcome to Helen Tung, founder of New Space 2016 and a leading expert in international law and emerging technologies. Helen is on mission to help individuals and organizations make better decisions. As an international lawyer, speaker, and consultant, she is known for her insightful talks on authenticity, alignment, and leveraging the laws of nature and the universe. In her various roles, including G100 Space Technology, Chair and Vice Chair of the Enterprise Risk Management Committee, Helen is at forefront of legal discussion surrounding space exploration and AI technologies. Today, Helen will be shedding light on the legal implication of using AI tools in her talk titled Legal Implication on the Use of AI Tools from Data Protection to Intellectual Property. She will guide us through what users need to know to navigate this rapidly evolving in landscape. So please give a big round of applause to Helen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's have a scan around the room. How many of you are developers? Hands up. Just want to get an idea. OK, very good. How many of you, you guys are content? Content people, OK, wonderful. How many of you are entrepreneurs? All hands should be up. OK, wonderful, wonderful. So I want to start by saying I am so delighted to be in Taipei. I'm so delighted to be in Taipei. And I want to say that this moment, this moment where you guys are here sitting with me, is a very powerful moment. Why? Because all the years of talking about AI, thinking, dreaming about AI, it's happening. And why is it a powerful day today? Well, in my talk, I am going to try and convince you guys, if not least, to share the relevance of why legal is important and why we need you and you need us. For too long, the conversations on law and AI in the sense of what are the legal issues and the technical developments have been two very separate conversations. And what's important for me as an advocate, as a lawyer, is also I'm very passionate in helping businesses and entrepreneurs like you guys. And I want to see the discussions of law and AI moving forward like this, in partnership, in conversation, and developing together. Because what have you noticed recently in the news? Everyone's getting very excited. You've got ChatGPT, BARD, and so forth. But equally, there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of worry about how do we regulate our AI? How do we contain potential dangerous scenarios? So we're going to touch upon all of that. And really, my talk is a call for action. It's a call for action for you guys to not take the back seat, but to take the front row in leading the conversation in partnership with us as lawyers. OK? So. Without further ado, let's start. A bit about myself, New Space 16. I'm really great. Pooja made the introduction. I'm a traditional lawyer in the sense that I got qualified in England and Wales. I started off as a litigator. I might not look like it, but I am. And then I worked in-house. I spent some time in Silicon Valley. I co-founded a satellite propulsion startup. I spent some time at NASA. And uh, my startup failed miserably. But hey, if you're an entrepreneur, you go through cycles. And so. In a small way, I can relate to most of you. Now, what is AI? I loved it for the last few days. We talked about what is AI in the meeting rooms, over lunch, and also in, on platforms. But for me, AI, on a high level, conceptual level, it's everything and anything you want it to be. Why? Because it's about your dream. It's about the lifestyle that you wish to have. It's about the ideas and turning it into a reality. And hence, 
I think this picture depicts it quite well, and it's also about envisioning what kind of a future that you want. So, I don't know if it's going to end up as a quote, but it is literally everything and anything we can think up. What is AI? If I had to encapsulate AI as a person, how would I describe them? Well, I would say they're a high performer. They never sleep and they never die. They can actually work and perform non-stop. They're time efficient, they're cost effective, and they're also very flexible. They can survive and maintain whatever they need to do in any environment. And I can also engage with them 24-7 due to constant connectivity. And by the way, even through avatars and different mediums, I can still be in touch. We're traveling time and space. And so hence, I had to put some imagination in there, like your fantasy dragon slayer, superhero magician. Is it really that far off, you might ask? Now, this is where I'm going to throw in a space concept, but not quite. Have you guys heard of the concept of parallel universe? Come on, all hands should be up. So we're living it. And I define it in a very simplistic way. You and I sitting here, the 3D versions of us, and we all have a mobile phone. We all have an online presence. That, be it our avatar, is a different universe. Some might take it to the next level and say it's metaverse. You don't need to be on a different planet to have another personality. And so that's why I think, in a humble way, we're already living the parallel universe. Now, more than that, and this is where the conversation can either go positive or negative, depending how you think of it. Who do I have here that's quite a famous personality? People should know. Gandhi. Now, my first thought about AI, and this is just to show how I think, was we can bring back the dead. All the famous philosophers like Aristotle, you know, Plato, to bring back the real ideas. Now, you might have a different version. You might think of the Frankenstein version, <laughs> the zombie version. I'm not thinking that. You can tell I'm an optimist. But there is something that is really beautiful about that idea. That kind of power is unspoken of, if you get what I'm trying to say, right? If not in the 3D, at least in the, you know, ultimate various universes. And of course, some of these images, whilst here I'm saying they're all, you know, digital and AI, but to the ordinary folk, particularly if you look at that frog, that looks pretty real to me, right? So, then we go on to the next topic, legal issues. Now. Before you get too bothered about this topic or feeling it's a bit heavy, let me share this idea with you. So I've been engaged in this topic of AI for a long, long time. In fact, I call myself an advocate because for years, starting in my career as a lawyer, I wanted to advocate more interest in AI because I know and I knew that it would come to this point where we had to have tough conversations. And a few years back, I attended the UN conference on AI. It's actually named quite nicely. It's called uh, AI for Good. You had, sh you had major stakes, stakeholders like the states, you had the military, you had academia, you had experts. And I looked around the room and I said, you know, someone's missing here. And they are you guys. Where are all the developers? Where are all the content people? I need those whiz kids in the back, you know, in the back garage to be here at the UN to, to be talking with us. And you know what I discovered in that conversation? It was a tough one to swallow. That maybe for the people who were making and developing, they were too busy. Or that they, they really don't think this is part of them. Like, why should we be talking about legal? We just, we just want to do our creative stuff. We just want to develop. We just want to do our work. So this is where I come in, right? I talked about this, the partnership, because it's at this point we need your help. Now, let's just have a look for a moment. What kind of legal issues? There's a whole heap. And I'll go through it, don't worry. I'll simplify it as much as I can. We have issues like liability and accountability. With great power is great responsibility. We have data and privacy and security. We have issues like bias and discrimination we need to tackle. Regulatory compliance, ethics, international laws and regulations. So let's have a look. 
What does liability and accountability mean? Now, what has been really interesting for me is I've heard some speakers sort of blip over the issue. No, really, AI systems are not liable. How sure can we be? Let's play this out a little, shall we? Now, you are a person. We call this someone in legal terms with legal personality. You, if you have a problem, you can go to court and file a claim. Now, just bear with me for a moment, because this concept has been tested in court for now. So you have some judgments in the US court primarily, and also in the UK, and there's a question that we ask. If you develop an AI system that can create artwork, who owns that artwork? Is it you, the creator, or is it the AI system that you created that could have the artwork? Now, this was tested in the court, and the court goes, no, this AI system does not have Why is this important? Now, it doesn't take a genius, but you can have a guess. If you are the artist, you have rights, you have obligations. If you create a piece of artwork, you are entitled to what? Trademark protection, license fees if people use your artwork, being paid for your services. Isn't that important? Correct? This is really important. So the question of where the liability sits right now, I think, is still out in the open. There are no concrete answers, but to give you some ideas, it could be the developer, it could be the creator, it could be the user, for example, if not reading the instructions properly. It might be the AI system. So we do need a legal framework to try and envisage how would this all work. Now, autonomy is an interesting one. To give you guys some idea of how I came into this, so I started off doing a PhD on piracy, not not cyber, but Pirates of the Caribbean piracy. And whatever you're seeing in Yemen right now, I deep, deep dived into it. But the point I'm trying to say is I looked into autonomous vessels, right? Ships with no one driving it, but you, know, you allow them to you know, press a button and say, okay, what level of autonomy do we want? Do we want the human in the loop, i.e. you're controlling the robot? Do we want the human out of the loop? We press go and the robot does whatever they want and we allow for them to have their own judgment call. Right? So these are the kind of discussions we're having and I'm really glad to say, at least in the maritime world, it's progressed a long way. But we're still there and just to simplify it, you don't need very complex cases. You just think of traffic systems. Right now, you drive your car on the road, you have a red light, a green light and a blue light, sorry. <laughs> Reframe, a green light, orange and a red. We all know what that means. So maybe it's something like that. We just need to understand what are the rules do we want to allow and enable the kind of systems and how they operate. And then there are other factors, right? If you develop a good and it goes rogue, yeah? this is the, the sort of classical Hollywood style when the robot you know, is out of control, or it's made defectively. Not intentionally, it's unintentionally, but in any event. And what impacts that has on licenses and licensees? So this is where the people in the, the business people are in put their caps on and say, hey, I bought a service and I need a good. And if, for instance, it doesn't line up to what I signed in the contract, are there liabilities, are there rights theirs? And then, of course, I gave the example of ships, but here you can also refer it to cars. And then it's also decision making. Right? You guys have clients. You serve a client when you develop something or you're selling content or doing content of sorts. So this is one of the questions that you also need to think about. How do we make decisions easy for the client? And then I go back to the basics. This is always important. First principles. What are our values when we're trying to make these complex decisions that will impact society? Because it does. And what are the exceptions to the rule? What are the exceptional circumstances? For example, if there was an emergency, right? We really want to give, if we cannot reach the fire at the top, if a robot can help us do that, why not? Let's give them full power, control, to save lives. And this is a very interesting contractual question. Validity in force majeure. Who knows what force majeure is? Okay. Law 101. Force majeure are situations beyond your control, like war, disaster, COVID as well. So if you have a situation where it's a force majeure, everything you signed up to is no longer valid. 
So we need to think about these things when we are embarking on our development. So, what are the issues? So here, I put down data privacy because a few years ago, and it's not that long ago, data was really not seen that important. And then over time, first it was Europe, then America, and then now even in the Middle East, and also in, in Asia, data has become increasingly important. Your data, be it health, whether you, ha you, know, you buy car insurance, it all matters because it's your information. And it may be sensitive, right? Some people, they might say, okay, I'm okay with sharing my data. Well, are you? And then, of course, there has to be a balance between public knowledge and private knowledge. For example, for all of you that have got Instagram, Twitter, whatnot, you are sharing your information because you want the public to know. But what if there's private information that's only between you and your family? You don't want others to know, right? So you're entitled to having your privacy protected. And other factors, and I just lay out a few rules. GDPR, if you haven't heard of it, start looking into it if you want to do business with Europe because it's a very important rule. And what does it mean? If the rules are not complied, it just means a massive fine. So that's always bad for business. And then, of course, there are contractual enforcements. If there's a major breach, what does it mean for a business? It's not just bad PR, but it does have implications. There's data risk, PR risk, financial risk. And of course, I want to say there are also gaps in the law in terms of AI specifically, because we're not there yet. The law has a long way to go to catch up. That's where we need your help. And of course, the other things I'm looking at are data rights. So you, your rights as a developer, your rights um, in terms of protections from the national systems and WIPO. Now, I have to ask a very interesting question. Of those that are developers here, do you put your stuff as open source? Okay, some of you. Do you sell your product? Okay, both. Wonderful. Because I just need to check. <laughs> because here, I hear a lot, there's about contribution and, you know, WordPress wouldn't be where it is today if it wasn't because of everyone's contribution. True, but you're also a business. So you need to survive and you need to sell. So that's the other thing you need to be mindful of, where you find that balance. Now, another thing we need to tackle is bias. Now, the speaker yesterday, I was um, so impressed by his uh, talk, and I said, what can we do about discrimination and issues? He says, we need to talk about it. So here we go. I'm also talking about it today. <laughs> so we need to consider the issues of algorithm bias. Now, I'm raising this to you because there's little much I can do as a lawyer, but you guys can, guys can do a hell of a lot as developers. The issues of gender, are we ensuring that there is enough representation? Now, if I look around the room, it looks pretty balanced, but in terms of what goes out there in the public, that's something we need an eye on. Colour, race, is that, is that considered? Um, I talk about different laws. Now, the EU is very progressive when it comes to AI laws. In fact, they recently published a guideline. In the UK, they did as well, primarily from the court, court setting. And my take is at this, okay? Laws are there for a reason, to, it's in to, to ensure the safety of people and there's no harm. But law is not there to hinder creativity and development. So in that sense, I'm with you guys. I want the law to be like the traffic system. I want the cars to run, but I need it to run safely so there's no collisions. Okay? Now, interesting fact, which you guys might know. I have to ask myself, what is the role of a future lawyer? So this talk is going to be interesting, not just for you guys, but other lawyers out there. Because recently, as you might have heard, the AI systems have been taking New York bar exams and American bar exams and passing with flying colours. What did it take for me to get my degree? Well, seven years of hard slog, lots of hours, work experience, writing, drafting, sleeping, probably no different from you guys, except you guys are in the computer science and, and engineering. So there's a big question mark. How would that impact on our lives and, of course, future careers, the next generation? And it's a valid question, because this idea of, well, will AI take our jobs away? Well, if we're not smart enough, we might do such a good job that we will get replaced. Does that kind of make sense?
But my take is, as an optimist, is no, we need to optimize technology so that it will help us in our lives. And so hence, the need for dialogue and for communication on what we really want. Now, I'm talking about legal, but we can't really talk about legal. We don't also talk about ethics and morality and, of course, international law. So to give you an idea of what, how this all legal jargon works, law is a bit like a cake. You have national laws, so here we're in Taiwan, we have Taiwan, and then you have maybe regional laws, and then you have international laws. So it's sort of like a layered cake. Interestingly, what's the strongest of all? I would say locally, but if you operate internationally, you kind of want to follow guidelines. And I'm sure you understand what I mean when you talk about international standards, certain standards that you need to meet. So that's why this conversation is so powerful, because whatever you think you're doing in your own small way, your own website, your own business, but hey, the internet is an interna international marketplace. So that puts it into perspective. Whatever you're doing is really, really powerful. And if we come together and we start looking at these issues, well, what we want is we want AI to promote benefits for humanity. What we want is we want to mitigate any potential harms. We want to improve justice systems, safety. Also, to ensure that there are no biases or at least fairness can be maintained. And then a level of autonomy security and control. And now, when we look at international law, so I can share with you, for us lawyers, we've been trying so hard to get to grips of how we can use AI to help the legal system. Help us to help you, right? To make fairer judgments, fairer decisions. So what you will find across the globe, um, I've spent a number of years in the Middle East, so I'm part of a um, Courts of the Future working group in the DIFC courts in Dubai, is we've thought about, you know, how do we get, com you know, come up with ideas and competitions? How would it look like if in the future we had a future AI judge? Would it be more time effective, cost effective? Can we solve problems more quickly? Because at the end of the day, some of you might know, in some justice systems, the way justice is played out is it just takes a very, very long time, unfortunately. Sometimes it takes up to 10 years, rightly or wrongly. So there needs to be a, a, a way to solve this backlog. And I think really the question is a balance between AI, innovation, sorry, and the law. And it may be right or wrong to say this, but you know, it's like the left brain and the right brain. We do think very differently, but somehow we need to find a middle way. So that's partly end, and now I'm going to go freestyle, if you don't mind, <laughs> without this. So I just want to get a short feedback from you guys of everything that I've said too far. Does that make sense to you so far? the importance of you guys and us talking to each other. Yeah? So, you, then next, so I just said this talk is about action. And it's about proactivity. So what can you do? Okay, because I, I love the fact that it's the style of speakers here that we talk, we share ideas, and we exchange knowledge, and then we hope everyone plays, you know, has a similar understanding. So I would say, I think WordPress is already a very powerful platform for people to talk and engage. And actually, for me, I almost feel it's the talk to the, the converted. I also need to talk to my peers on how they can get interested with you guys. Why am I saying this? The legal process is not a straightforward one. I am fortunate to say I've been qualified in a number of jurisdictions, so I can speak, relatively speaking, as an international lawyer. I was qualified in England and Wales first. I'm a foreign registered lawyer in Australia, and I also work in the Middle East, in UAE. There are different ways of doing things, but there are some countries that are faster than other. And this is where I want to think about it strategically since we're in Taiwan, Taipei. Okay? So, when entrepreneurs come to me, when I wear my New Space 2060 hat, and they get stuck, and they don't know what they're doing, and I'm thinking specifically a startup where they have a thousand water drones and they want to get it out in the water. And they come to me and they say, Helen, I don't think we really need to worry about the law. We just, you know, file this out. And of course, you know, I'm the one that's sitting back and going, gosh, <laughs> yeah, we have a problem. Why do we have a problem? Because it's okay when you do it and nothing happens, but it's not okay when there's a collision. Something happens, right? So, we take a precautionary approach. That's, 
us as a lawyer, as an advisor, and taking a step back. But then we also need to understand where you're coming from, right? And I can tell you right now, just over the last three days, the speed with which you guys work, I don't know if anyone's told you this, is fast. I can tell you that because I've attended a lot of conferences, I've spoken in a lot of places. I can sense the tempo, and you guys get it very quickly. It's a compliment, okay? <laughs> That's the upside. But in the legal profession, if you come to a law conference, the difference is we will be ugh, juggling, debating, having problems. We are nowhere near the solution. We're nowhere near the solution. And that is where there is a gap. There is a knowledge gap. And this is where you guys come in. So as much as you know, people have this stereotype of what a lawyer can do for us, very little, we've got a contract, we just need them to review and sign, I think you guys would do so much to actually help us to understand how can we be a force for good? Now that's a thought, right? Not just AI for good, but actually as developers, as content developers. And for me, I think what's really interesting is because I call myself a legal futurist, I do think a little bit ahead of the curve. A little bit, just a little bit. So, for example, about seven, eight years ago, when I was working in the UK Maritime Coast Guard as a legal policy advisor, I already brought up the issue of drones. But my re the response I had was, Helen, we're nowhere near there. We're nowhere near there. What's happening right now? Every country that has a sea border is testing out their water drones. Yeah? So what I did was I went, uh, collaborated with a bunch of 15 other lawyers. We sat down, we got other parties engaged, and we say, hey, let's have a working group. Let's talk about this issue of autonomous ships. And I'm giving you this example to give you ideas, right? Autonomous ships, let's engage in the parties. We talked about learning and development. We talked about, well, how would it look like if it was a vessel without a captain in the water, on shore? How would we be able to make sure that you know, we can still handle risks? Oh, by the way, we don't have insurance. Do you know how much a vessel costs? Millions. So what happens if something happens out there? It's a lot of money. So then we've got, right, OK, we need to talk to Lloyd's Insurance. So back in 2000, it was July, I remember very clearly, 2015, Lloyd's launched their first insurance covering autonomous vessels. It's a milestone. It's a slow milestone, but it's a milestone. And so from there, things have just moved on, and Asia has just picked up pace. And I would say, quite humbly, they've really on par or succeeded what the Europeans are doing right now in terms of autonomous vessels. What I'm trying to say is things can be achieved like this. We can actually sit around a table, talk about what you want, talk about what problems and issues you're facing, and actually see the lawyer a bit like not just like a lawyer, but like a, we call it trusted advisor, but a friend that can actually sit down and say, hey, how can we actually come together and think, how can we solve this together? You see, this missing part, i.e. you guys, of the equation is something for me, a simple question of communication. Do you guys get me? Yeah? Because if it's a whole bunch of very intelligent, Harvard-qualified, Oxford-qualified lawyers sitting in a room, they're not going to solve the problem. They're not going to solve the problem. They need you guys sitting on the table with them to talk about, hey, this is what we're really doing. You can be a bit lighter on us. OK. So I'm really, really excited about what's going to happen next. And I really feel, you know, like all good things, there's never a good time, but this is the perfect time. This is really, truly the perfect time. And it really starts with you guys. Because, I think we also had a previous speaker, we have so much to contribute. Our knowledge, our talent, and we don't need to relearn the skills. You guys have been doing whatever you're doing for the last 10, 15 years plus, right? So it's not about you know, teaching Nan to suck eggs. It's actually you coming with us and let's work together on how we can build the safeguards and also the laws and regulations that we want. So I invite you all to follow me. Um, I've got... Instagram, LinkedIn, but I'm going to be talking about this for a very long time coming. <laughs> so, you know, I'd love to be able to work with you guys and also engage with you guys um, in your creativity and your success. So thank you very much. Thank you.
oh, before we finish, finish, I'd love to take a selfie photo. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. We'll take a selfie photo and then we'll finish Q&A. <laughs> okay. Okay. One, two, three. Perfect. Thank you. No, thank you. And, uh, if anyone has any question, please feel free to ask. Is there any question? Yes, there's a question at the back. Hello, Helen. Thank you so much for your talk. Very interesting. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see the relationship between ethics and the law and like what the separation there is. Cause mm. I'm sure you're familiar with Temnit Gebru and like her AI Ethics Institute and the work that they're doing. There's a lot of like interpretation of the law and the limitations of it, I think, there. But then, you know, that's quite different from like liability, which I think's, well, it's an, in it's an interesting different motivation for interpreting the law. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about how you see the, um, yeah, the relationship between ethics and the law and the two okay. considerations there. Okay. So I can say it's a, it's a delicate one. And even as a back then young going as a law student, I struggled. Because ethics, and if you line ethics with morality, right, not the law. The law is like what is right and what's wrong, but morality is more an internal compass. Hence that's why I also mentioned the issue of values and we need to talk about values, like what we care about in society. I give you a very simple example. In my torts class, First year law student, we had a question, which was, you see a drowning girl, do you have a moral obligation to save them? Who thinks they have a moral obligation to say, save a drowning girl? Okay, curious. Okay, most hands, good. How about a legal obligation? Do you have a legal obligation? Oh, okay, okay. So you know what the actual answer I got was? So maybe as a moral obligation, you might have to save that girl. But a legal obligation is only when if you establish a duty of care. Okay, that's quite technical. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Okay, you're on a flight. You, you've seen these in the movies. You're on a flight. Someone's had a, having a heart attack and they call out, is there a doctor here? Yeah? Now that's the call to establish a duty of care. If the doctor puts their hand up and says, yep, I'm the doctor, and they come and save that individual, that individual dies, the family may or may not sue them. That's the legal connection. But if the doctor stays silent or they slept, they didn't hear the call to call for a doctor, then there's no obligation, even though they're a doctor on the flight with someone having a heart attack. So the question that you're asking, which is a very good one, is say you're a developer, you're designing something. Do you design with the intention of use? Yes. Now, this is where I'm very careful in what I'm also saying. You're designing with a careful use for this purpose. But for this purpose, you're not factoring if it goes malfunction. You know, like I was talking about the, you know, the, the robot that went rogue. You had no intention, okay? Or it was uh, you decide for this function, but something else happened. Or the user didn't read the manual. Yeah, you have that happening as well, right? Some people use some equipment, things go on fire, and then they try to figure out. So these are the kind of questions, I, I suppose you could say, scenario role-playing that is also... That is impor also important to discuss, right? It's a bit like the ugly elephant in the room. We don't really want to talk about it. We just want to do our stuff. We want to do our creative thing, which is great, wonderful. Totally get it. But then I think what we're seeing, and if I may also mention it, have you guys been reading stuff about people being silently bullied or you know, people committing suicide and all this kind of stuff because of the internet? You're like, what is going on? Now, then you might take a step back, well, who's responsible for that? Well, if, we, if it's not the individual, i.e. the perpetrators, then it's a society issue, because clearly that's not, a, that's not a consequence that we want from the technology that we're developing, correct? Or let's take it one step further, which is a bit probably more true, is you've got so much cyber attacks or frauds, right? That's also a concern. So the responsibility there is how do you ensure you get your stuff out there, but how do we ensure the users, end users are also safe, right? bank transactions, 
you know, all this kind of stuff. It's way beyond, way beyond me. Then we need the cyber experts in. But you get what I'm trying to say. So the, the idea is that it's multifaceted. It's definitely not a one dimension. And also, it's, it's knowledge building. You know, it's, it's quite interesting. So obviously, as a lawyer, I also have some background in understanding rules and regulations on cyber issues. And I remember I worked with this huge organization, their whole business in trading. And I wanted to promote a, a, a training on cyber, cyber issues. And you know, management was not interested. They're like, why are we spending time? It's simple. You see an email, looks dodgy, don't open it. And guess what happens? They open it. And then what happens? It's a total meltdown. <laughs> Client accounts, data being lost, you know. I've gone through it twice in my whole career, live, right? And you can just imagine, you're like, you're sitting, you're taking a step back and go, you know what? It would have been good if we sort of had a plan B. It would have been good if we sort of had a conversation about this, you know? And, and I think this is where we're at. We're at this stage where we can talk about it, right? As we're developing, as we're, you know, as ugly and as, you know, but sometimes I think we, if we look at it this way, right? What is, if I had to reframe my talk, what would it be? I would call it life and death. Why? because we are all going through a transformative phase. Either you're transforming or we're transforming. And to give you an insight, I believe my legal profession needs to transform, otherwise we will no longer exist. <laughs> I know, as damning as that sounds, but if we don't get smart about how we use technology, how we adopt, how we change, that's where the worry is. But as an optimist, as I say, there's always a silver lining. We just need to be one step ahead of the curve and try and figure it all out together. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else want to ask a question? Yes. Yeah. It's a few. Okay, I'm not sure if you heard about the dollar Chevy Tahoe in the US, okay. um, where they tricked the chatbot to sell the Chevy Tahoe for a dollar. Okay. I kind of want to know your thoughts about the AI chatbots. Are the companies going to be held responsible in the future? And is it a bad thing for me as a developer to try to break into someone's system via their chatbot? Thank you. I think uh, if I was in that situation, I saw a business opportunity, I'd probably knock on the, the door and say, hey, I can solve your problem for X amount. That's probably a better move than trying to hack into someone's account. Um, so to a certain extent, I would have to say, yeah. Because, you know, this idea, if you are the seller, you know, you could be selling a bottle of water. You could be selling, for all I know, whatever, chips. What you're trying, it's, it's called misrepresentation, right? So if, if you're gonna sell land or property, it doesn't matter what you're trying to do. What you say and what product you end up with should kind of be the same, right? Like this would be no different. And the fascinating thing is, rather than saying, okay, we have to scrape all the law, no, we can uh, keep the laws. I was having a conversation with one of the, the guys in the room and he said, well, how, how, how's the law been functioning? So in America, when we first had computers, they used the highway code. Figure that one out. How do you connect l computer and the highway code? Well, there's a highway system. It's very original. But it's got to the point where we can try and lend, borrow laws where we can and stretch it as far as we could. But to be honest with you, there are concepts, like what you've just mentioned, well, have we even defined a chatbot like in legal terms? I don't think we have. And we haven't even, you know, we haven't even conceptualized, well, what does it actually do? We haven't got a universal, you know, international standard term of what that actually means. So I think there's, a, there's opportunities for discussions on that. Now, this is where it gets interesting, right? It gets interesting because if you, and let's say for a moment, the law at this point as we're talking says, well, no, we're not going to give them basically separate legal identities. But what if five, ten years later, we say, hey, you know, they're so popular, they're attracting fans, they're literally a legal identity in itself. In other words, that chatbot, let's call it alpha for argument's sake, is the most popular, you know, influencer online. And actually, they can generate without anyone else mentioning them, right? Revenue, um, you know, watch time, whatever it is. And if they can actually act independently, then that's a huge question. There are so many, there are so many issues. But then you've got the other question is, well, then how can you control and contain? But you've still got that element of question of, well, what if it goes rogue? Where can we step in? How can we step in? You know? 
No. Okay. Yes, I would think so. Absolutely, and there's another trend I can share with you guys in the legal world, and it's called class action. I'm sure Americans are very familiar with that term. So after this, I'm going to London, and I'm talking about ESG class action. And what that means is it's people coming together. So there's one class action that already started in Australia, and it's against Google and Apple. And their argument is that they're overcharging customers for the services that they're paying. So you might be a third-party service provider. You somehow need to connect with Google through their payment system, and they get a cut, 60%, 80%, whatever, and this third party only gets 20%. And they're saying it's not good for consumers because, in essence, you're charging high cost. But we should lower the cost, and, get a, and customers should get a refund because it's not, it's not fair otherwise. So we'll see what happens. So... Inevitably, we're going to see stuff like that as well. Now, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, interestingly, ESG is a slightly different topic because what are we fighting for? We're fighting for the environment. So, of course, it's a good thing, <laughs> right? If you're getting companies to pay out you know, against air pollution, water pollution, whatever pollution, right? Um, but on the face of it, based on what you're saying, then sure, you know, but they should rectify it as soon as possible. I mean, you know, I'll give you a really good example. It's called damage control. And that's something we have to learn as well, right? Back then, this is quite a few years ago, Tesco, it's a supermarket chain in the UK. They accidentally sold horse meat and they packaged it as beef mince. Okay? When they found that ASAP, they did one of the most incredulous things, which 10 years ago they wouldn't have done, which was they made a huge announcement and apologizing that this is the mistake that they've done, they will provide refunds, et cetera, et cetera. Because the opposite would have been to let it slide, pretend it never happened, and deny it. But that would have backfired, right? And this is where we need the PR team, right? This is beyond legal, but you would need the PR team to sort of, you know, quell everyone's concern and anger and frustration, right? So, so yes, there are, these are the kind of things, like what you've just mentioned, is something that, you know, Management and developers need to talk together, right? Because it's not, there's no good if, for example, you as a developer are having this problem, management just saying, oh, you deal with it. Because the damage is so great that, you know, it's, it's really not just a one person's problem. Yeah. I think there are a few other questions there. Yeah. Sorry, we, Hello. Are, yeah, we do not have much oh, time, so okay. please feel free to meet her oh, okay. after the room. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Thank you for your Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much.